Welcome, and thank you all for joining us today for our Monash Prato Dialogue Distinguished Lecture Series in Artificial Intelligence. I'm Professor Joanna Batstone, the Director of the Monash Data Futures Institute at Monash University in Australia, and I will be your host and moderator. We are also joined today by my colleagues from the Monash Data Futures Institute, the largest interdisciplinary community of AI and data science thought leaders in Asia Pacific. Before we begin, I wish to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we are gathered today. I pay my respects to their elders, past and present. Welcome to the 2023 series of the Monash Prato Dialogue Distinguished Lectures in Artificial Intelligence, where we aim to explore the evolving impact of data science and AI in society by fostering a global dialogue. Launched in 2021, this Distinguished Lecture Series takes its name from Monash University Center in Prato, Italy, that represents an international base for research, education, intellectual and cultural exchanges, and enables us to bring people together to meet, learn, and collaborate with peers and colleagues from around the world. Before I introduce today's speaker and begin with the official proceedings, a few pointers on housekeeping. Please drop any questions you may have in the Q&A function of this webinar, not in the chat function, and we'll get to them at the end of the lecture. Also, please join us in the conversation on social media by following us on Twitter at MonashDFI and by using the hashtag MonashPratoDialogue. For our first lecture of 2023, we are very pleased to host Professor Shannon Valor. Professor Shannon Valor is the Bailey Givard Professor in the Ethics of Data and Artificial Intelligence in the University of Edinburgh's Department of Philosophy. She directs the Center for Technomoral Futures in the Edinburgh Futures Institute and co-directs the UKRI Enabling a Responsible AI Ecosystem Program. She's also a fellow of the Alan Turing Institute. Professor Valor's research explores how emerging technologies reshape human, moral, and intellectual character, and maps the ethical challenges and opportunities posed by new uses of data and artificial intelligence. Her work includes advising academia, government, and industry on the ethical design and use of AI. In today's lecture, Professor Valor will address the bootstrapping problem with AI for social good and the impact of related suggestions to develop more virtuous or responsible models of AI innovation. We're very pleased to host Shannon today and we're delighted you can join us. Over to you, Shannon, and we look forward to your lecture. Thank you, Joanna. Uh, and thanks to uh, everyone who has organized uh, and supported this series and those who are joining us today. I'm really excited to be able uh, to, to share this presentation with you. So I'm going to share my screen. Uh, as usual, we hold our breath. Hope that it works. Uh, looks like it does. And um, just one moment here while I make sure that we can advance things properly. Yeah, okay, great. Um, so I'm going to talk about the virtues, which some of you may be familiar with work that I've done on the techno-moral virtues, uh, the virtues that we need in order to cultivate better technologies. And I wrote this talk really in part as a challenge to myself to think about that proposal more deeply and to recognize a, a, a difficulty in that proposal uh, that uh, I think we haven't adequately confronted. And that is this bootstrapping problem. Uh, that I'm going to talk about in a moment. I'm going to talk about AI uh, for good, uh, and uh, I will get to that uh, a little bit after I present the fundamental problem that I think we have to consider when we talk about the cultivation of virtues as a way to address the gap in responsible technology of any kind. Uh, but I think the AI for good proposals uh, that currently center a lot of the discourse around AI ethics are, uh, I think, challenged by this problem in a particularly acute way. 
Okay, so let me set the stage here. Uh, I want to begin by confronting the reality that we are in a very difficult moment historically uh, as a species, um, as uh, a uh, moment in modernity. Uh, I, I think we, we have to recognize that in order to realize that the social and philosophical and moral and political scripts that we have been upholding and valorizing for quite some time now may no longer service as well as they previously have. For example, um, it's often the case that uh, in academia, the more restrained and moderate your claim, uh, the more seriously uh, it's taken, uh, the more serious you as a scholar are taken. We take nuance, epistemic caution, and heavy qualification of any claims to be hallmarks of rigorous science. Uh, anyone who uh, starts talking about previously unthinkable or unprecedented harms might sell more books or garner more clicks. Uh, but generally, we, we take this not to be the hallmark of sober minds. Um, and prima facie, we tend to not trust people who say everything is changing. And in educated circles, such a habit has long been seen as an intellectual virtue. And it's, a, it's been a, a very helpful habit uh, uh, or a very helpful virtue on a historical scale as a shield against fear mongering and demagoguery and charlatans of every political and scientific stripe. Uh, but we might consider the fact that this could be an unfortunate time to be anchored uh, to that uh, intellectual habit of epistemic caution and heavy qualification uh, because we are not in normal times, right? Uh, things are not okay. So we have to consider how that might alter what counts as an intellectual virtue. Uh, take climate change, for example, right? Um, one of the difficulties we've had with articulating the scale of the threat that climate change poses to us is that as soon as someone starts talking uh, in a scientific vein about these threats, it seems like they are being hyperbolic. Uh, it seems as if they are speaking outside the language of intellectual virtue that we're accustomed to, where uh, we talk uh, very carefully about possibilities, probabilities. Um, we don't talk about things like crisis. Uh, in the sciences. We don't talk about things like uh, the end of civilization when we talk about uh, um, matters of, uh, uh, of scientific rigor. Uh, so I'm trying to point out that that might not actually have served us very well over the last few decades uh, because it has fed a particular kind of skepticism about scientific claims about just how bad a mitigated climate change could be. And I think we can think about the way that same dynamic played out in the pandemic, right? Uh, that the people who were uh, uh, initially uh, quite alarmed about the prospect of COVID-19 becoming a devastating global pandemic were initially uh, distrusted uh, and accused of being hyperbolic. Uh, and that led to a very sluggish response to the pandemic initially uh, when we could have perhaps uh, been more proactive and uh, mitigated uh, a lot of the damage earlier uh, had we not been so distrustful of uh, claims of that sort. So I wanna just point this out as an example of the kind of possibility where something that has been an intellectual virtue in a particular historical moment ceases to be constructive and becomes maladapted uh, to our well-being. So my point is that moral and epistemic virtues are a form of cultural adaptation to a specific environment for human flourishing. And when that environment changes subtly and radically, our virtues, or at least our customary pattern of expressing them, can be maladapted and in rare cases even pose a danger. So we might think then, uh, virtues of character uh, that are poorly attuned to changing needs and circumstances is something like vestigial organs, right? They might be the moral and epistemic equivalents of the appendix or the wisdom tooth. So 
the, the broader argument here I'm making is not just about this virtue of epistemic restraint, which I acknowledge still plays a vital protective role in many contexts, protecting us from deception, manipulation, over hasty or motivated reasoning. My argument is just that when we think about the problems of the world, and particularly those arising from new technologies like AI, and our need for better responses to those problems, it's not enough to simply ask for ethical AI. It's not enough to ask for value-aligned AI or AI for good. And in fact, as someone who has, instead of using that language, often talked about uh, the need to cultivate virtues in ourselves to manage the new challenges arising from AI, uh, I, I think uh, my own framing uh, is challenged by this problem. Uh, without critical reflection on the challenge that I highlight today, uh, I think it's actually dangerous to respond to this moment of crisis by just demanding more virtue from ourselves. Now, why is that? Uh, it's because we need to first consider this disruption of the general pattern of the virtuous person that follows from how fundamentally and rapidly the modern human environment has changed in the last century uh, and will change in the next. For what we routinely take to be profiles of goodness and excellence might in fact in certain domains now be deficient and maladapted to the human family's future flourishing. And that means that pursuing more goodness guided only by the forms of goodness that we most easily recognize and valorize today might be like trying to get out of a hole by continuing to dig. So how do we direct our moral sights to the forms of goodness that we actually need for the future and for the guidance of technologies like AI when our present virtues are precisely what have trained our moral sight? So this is the bootstrapping challenge and to meet it, I think will require an unprecedented collective exercise of the virtue called practical wisdom. And I'll explain later why I think that virtue can help us get out of this hole. Now, I wanna acknowledge that what I've called, you know, the general pattern of the virtuous person, which I'm suggesting might be changing or needing to change, um, at least from what we recognize today. Uh, that general pattern is, of course, nothing universal. There's great variance among perceptions of virtue, uh, even within contemporary human cultures. And I think this is actually a source of hope for us in the bootstrapping challenge. But one force has driven a particular constellation of virtue into a dominant global position over the past two centuries. And that's the virtues associated with the cultivation of modern industrial technoscience and its socioeconomic order. Indeed, I think we have to consider the fact um, that the well-known vices associated with modern industrial technoscience uh, and extractive capitalism, greed, oppression, exploitation, uh, uh, might be actually a bit of a distraction from the real problem. Those are soft and well-marked targets. We know those are bad things. We know that those are things that we uh, do not want to uh, further incentivize and, and reinforce in society. Now, we still haven't gotten very good at um, uh, disincentivizing those things, um, but that's really not the focus of my talk. I wanna reevaluate the virtues associated with the modern global order. What we think are the best qualities of the noblest among our practitioners of scientific inquiry, our inventors and technologists, our entrepreneurs, educators, and democratic leaders. So I think we need to consider the fact that uh, this general pattern of virtue associated with the modern technoscientific order must have been misaligned with our planetary and social circumstances for longer than the 70 odd years for which our path to civilizational crisis has been obvious. If we're today on the brink of civilizational decline or collapse, uh, as opposed to a kind of blip, uh, a red readily reversible uh, kind of problem. If instead we're really on the brink of uh, a severe disintegration of the foundations of, of civilizational flourishing on this planet, then a backwards looking assessment of our recent understanding of human virtue can't be very favorable if we're being objective, right? Virtues are supposed to align us with human flourishing. If we're on the brink of losing our capacity to flourish, then our conception of the virtues um, might not have been uh, very well aligned 
uh, uh, for, for a bit. So this, again, is what I mean by the bootstrapping problem. We're in a civilizational pickle. There's only two things that can deliver us safely past the various existential threats that we face from climate change to the next global pandemic uh, to uh, the threat of AI not rising up and attacking humans, uh, but being used to deprive humans of opportunity, of uh, justice, of um, the uh, autonomy uh, that uh, human dignity uh, demands. So if these are existential threats, uh, then we need coordinated and widespread human excellence in developing planetary scale interventions and systemic reforms of our socioeconomic order, our political order, uh, our uh, ways of using and uh, producing energy. Uh, that's, a big, that's a big ask. The alternative, though, is to ask for divine rescue, and most of us probably think uh, that that's a poor gamble. So we need the first thing. We need a human virtue deployed at planetary scale in order uh, to reform the fundamental institutions that are no longer serving us adequately and no longer uh, protecting uh, the interests of human flourishing uh, for a sustainable future. Now, that's a daunting task, right? But this talk is actually going to make that sound more daunting. Because uh, I think we have to rethink first and relearn what virtue is. Because simply doubling down on the virtues of the best minds of the generations that got us in this pickle is no wiser than using a golden shovel to dig your way out of a hole. Now, one way of understanding what I'm suggesting is to think about the multifaceted role of what Aristotle called phronesis or practical wisdom, the intellectual virtue that coordinates and perfects the virtues of moral character. Practical wisdom is precisely what saves the virtuous person from being led into disaster by mindless adherence to reflexive moral habits and social scripts that can be misaligned with the moral sense of particular situations. And this function of wisdom is famously illustrated by the Confucian philosopher Mengzi, who explains why a firm social taboo against, let's say, a man touching his sister-in-law will be set aside by the virtuous man who will pull her to safety from drowning, even if he has to grab uh, her body in order to do it, right? Uh, and that's because it should be obvious that moral virtue has to be embodied with intelligence, not mindless rigidity. And this moral intelligence or practical wisdom is not merely calculative. It doesn't simply deduce the proper course of action from explicit rules and principles. Instead, moral intelligence often has to be productive. So from novel situations that we encounter, our moral intelligence must often generate a new moral sense and a new kind of action guidance that suits it. Usually though, practical wisdom plays a far less radical role, right? It merely adjusts or tunes the expression of an individual virtue to the sense of a particular situation. And uh, this is what Aristotle meant when he said that phronesis is the ability, for example, to see in an individual act of honesty just how to tell the truth, how to tell it in the right way, to whom and to when, and to what degree to tell the truth. So here the virtue of phrenesis is just adjusting the virtue. It's not changing what the virtue is. However, the radically uh, productive uh, uh, possibilities of phrenesis uh, are not explicitly investigated by Aristotle or by Confucian moral philosophers who have their own account of uh, moral intelligence and, uh, 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 and flexibility. And, and certainly none of the sort of classical virtue theorists thought about the need uh, for radical moral transformation of collective moral life or collective moral scripts. Aristotle never imagines practical wisdom being deployed to question and reform the general pattern of ancient Athenian virtue and fit it to new social or environmental conditions. That was outside the scope uh, of his understanding. And this is true, again, not just of Greek uh, moral philosophy and virtue ethics, but uh, of, of other uh, classical traditions as well. Uh, none of them had this notion of the sort of 
ground changing under our feet uh, and, and the conditions of society and the conditions of human flourishing changing so radically that an entirely new picture of virtue would need uh, to be constructed. Um, so that again means that we have to do something uh, I think that the ancients didn't, right? Which is use uh, phronesis, use practical wisdom uh, in a more a kind of radical vein uh, in a more constructive and creative mode. So part of what I'm saying as a virtue ethicist is I think virtue ethics is uh, actually challenged directly here by, um, by the problems that we're facing. And some scholars have pointed out that this is a limitation of virtue ethics, uh, that it works well as long as uh, you're in a kind of stable and, and fixed social setting where the conditions uh, of human flourishing are quite clear. Now, if morality were nothing more than an exercise of calculative reasoning, the bootstrapping problem I'm pointing out would still exist because um, we have our innate and learned cognitive biases that could obstruct our reasoning about uh, what we ought to do. Uh, but virtue ethics is vulnerable to the bootstrapping problem in a more fundamental way because it presupposes that our internal resources for moral excellence and the moral sense-making that they enable aren't lodged in some knowledge repository that can just be edited at will, but they're deeply embedded in our character so that they become inseparable from our identities. So then what happens when the moral character of persons and that of our societies urgently needs to change? In the next section of the talk, I'm gonna examine this intersection uh, of the bootstrapping problem with the increasing pressure that we face to align our collective moral competence with our technical competence, to cultivate what I've called the technomoral virtues and apply them to technologies like AI. So today's social, political, and environmental problems demand an unprecedented alignment of moral and technical competence. Excellence in the design and development of technical systems can no longer ignore the ethical dimension, and we know this. This is, this is now uh, common sense, thankfully. Of course, the same could have been said at any time since the first bridge collapse, right? Public concerns about the integrity and trustworthiness of those who construct the built world are as old as technology itself and have been codified in responses uh, by, let's say, professional engineering societies that date back to at least the early 20th century. But today's demands go well beyond existing codes of engineering ethics uh, and even computing ethics, which already articulate clear duties of professional integrity and care for public safety. Today's technologists, especially those who design, develop, deploy, or maintain AI, are now being asked to exercise sound judgment about their work's impact on a far more expansive set of moral goods, from social fairness and justice to privacy and autonomy, to the transparency and accountability of socio-technical systems, to democratic health and the sustainability of the planet. Consider, for example, rapid advances in the engineering of so-called artificially intelligent software systems that can all too easily amplify human biases and disinformation at global scale, tempt us to automate judicial, medical, or military decision-making, generate online synthetic personas and cultural content that now mix imperceptibly with authentic human persons and their creations. Our built systems have always been impossible to disentangle from the complex social institutions, norms, and practices that shape and are shaped by our technology. But as philosopher Hans Jonas noted almost a half century ago, Today's technologies and the people who design and build them are at the very heart of pressing existential, moral, and political questions that used to be the primary labor of philosophers and theologians. These are questions about what we owe to one another, what it is to be human, and how or if we can preserve the conditions for life and human flourishing for future generations, right? Those are the questions that AI presents today. But those aren't questions that typically were um, constructed for engineers to answer. Are today's technologists educated and professionalized to bear the responsibility to confront those kinds of questions, much less the task of answering them wisely and well? I think we know the answer is no, we haven't educated technologists uh, for that kind of task. In an era when hyper-specialized STEM curricula are ever further divorced from the liberal arts and humanities, I actually think that many technologists today are being set up by our educational and cultural frames for failure. 
they're being set up for failure to meet the new social expectations that increasingly demand from them far more than professional competence and integrity. Uh, they're getting uh, expectations that could only be met by the exercise of what I've called techno-moral wisdom. And these failures that I think uh, technologists, uh, including AI developers, are being set up for cannot be safely ignored because they only amplify growing public distrust of scientific and technical expertise with harmful consequences that are already evident in arenas from public health to climate policy. So I think we have to explore the causes of uh, and the potentially radical remedies for this growing and unsustainable tension between the virtues of technical excellence and moral excellence. And these kind of suspicious attitudes that I'm talking about and these resentments of, of technology that are growing um, are not limited to the conspiracy minded or the uneducated. So consider the slogan, fuck the algorithm that emerged in street protests by students and parents in the UK in the summer of 2020 following the disastrous rollout by the government of an ill-designed and socially regressive algorithmic solution uh, to the pandemic related cancellation of university entrance exams. Within months, that slogan had spread to protests on the Stanford University campus over a crude and unfair algorithmic solution to the distribution of the COVID vaccine to their medical staff. And technologists themselves aren't immune to this distrust in the wake of corporate scandals, such as Google's firing of their pioneering AI ethics team, alongside the litany of examples of abuse of women and other underrepresented groups in computing departments and online communities. And after witnessing a seemingly endless tide of morally and scientifically discreditable uses of AI tools, uh, for purposes that amount to kind of modern day phrenology, computing researchers are in a lot of communities demoralized and divided and even distrustful of their own. And if you've been online in some of these communities, you've seen that play out. We've also got this problem that broadly speaking, digital technologies, not just AI, are increasingly linked in the public imagination with the use of illegitimate, unjustly distributed and exploitative power. Now, what's important for our purposes is that this isn't a critique of the misuse and abuse of technology by bad actors such as rogue states or malicious hackers or terrorists, right? Those were the narratives of the 90s. What are the bad people gonna do with technology? The perception today is that the very best actors in this sphere, those who are most lauded for excellence are the ones driving this harm. Now, public fears about tech and its alignment with human well-being actually go back to antiquity, right? Um, but, you know, for a long time, we, we had uh, measures of responding to it, right? We had the use of government regulation to constrain technology's harmful applications. And we had the expansion of professionalization in engineering fields in order to secure public trust and manage risk. Uh, and by the 90s, when I first started teaching these subjects, these responses were largely seen as adequate to the task, right? Um, and in fact, at the turn of the century, if you picked up uh, uh, some widely used engineering ethics textbook, it would tell a similar story. It would have a parade of engineering disasters and scandals caused by ethical and institutional failings from uh, the Fair Act 25 disaster to the Challenger shuttle explosion. And it would present these as violations of public trust and uh, which were now gonna be prevented through the improved educational and professional inculcation of ethical ideals and principles of conduct for engineers, right? But the political winds of deregulation and the expansion of regulatory capture were already weakening the supports of that still very shaky edifice of responsibility. And that could not withstand the, the shock of a new technological hegemony from big tech and the associated shift of a new generation of engineers from intermediaries of social power to its primary executors, right? So we now have a situation where the platforms that structure and shape the very media culture and public conversations uh, uh, that, that we're having um, hold the power. And yet uh, those conversations are what are supposed to legitimate power and hold it accountable. So this is the kind of unchecked social power that Plato and Aristotle thought it would take a legion of rigorously tested and trained philosopher kings to exercise justly and wisely. And most philosophers would wince at even that optimism. But today the power to design our futures 
disrupt and transform our institutions and steer the daily behaviors of billions is held by a distributed multitude of technologists who can attain a computer science or engineering degree without being asked to read a single account of the nature of justice or the limits of political authority or even the general shape of world history. So I want us to think about what the consequences of that are. Again, the point is not that computing professionals are ignorant or ill-equipped. The, the point is that we haven't prepared them uh, for the tasks that we've given them, right? The ground under their feet has shifted radically and our educational institutions have hardly taken stock, much less adequately uh, responded. Because the moral demands on today's technologists go well beyond the professional virtues of technology, diligence and integrity. The responsibilities thrust upon them go far beyond care for public safety and avoidance of mass death. Um, and in fact, I don't even know if the notion of responsibility is strong enough, right? Normally acting responsibly doesn't require exemplary virtue. A teenager can act responsibly as long as they demonstrate basic care for the interests of others and avoid recklessness. But to safely entrust other people with the uncommon power and influence over billions of lives and the shape of the future that technologies like AI are transforming, we would ask for quite a bit more uh, than what we ask for uh, from a responsible teenager, right? So there are these steadily intensifying and tightening dependencies between computing and the fundamental conditions of human flourishing. The effects of the internet um, are now seen as tightly conjoined with or even constitutive of the fate of democracy and the impact of AI is often seen to be the primary determinant of the future shape of the global economy and human culture, right? So technologists are being asked to address and assume responsibility for issues that go beyond our standard picture of the virtues of uh, an, an excellent technologist or, or engineer. Uh, we're asking from them the kinds of virtues that would only be uh, at best uh, visible in exemplars of human practical wisdom, of phronesis. Um, because ordinary moral life uh, doesn't require phronesis very often uh, or to be, or, or rather it doesn't require it to be uh, displayed at the level of kind of creative construction of new moral landscapes that I talked about earlier, right? But that kind of virtue where we just have to be able to recognize the, the familiar pattern of moral virtue and reproduce it, that's no longer sufficient. Right? An ordinarily honest professional uh, can't resolve the challenge of moderating online content for dangerous falsehoods and conspiracies while at the same time preserving the appropriately free exchange of ideas. An ordinarily fair machine learning engineer may have no idea how to identify what constitutes a fair algorithm for distributing scarce healthcare resources when confronted with numerous competing fairness metrics that can't be simultaneously satisfied. In, order, in, in addition to other pressing demands of social justice that can't be formally defined at all. And these are garden variety challenges, right, for today's software professionals. They're not the exotic edge cases. They're not the dizzying conundrums that come from the new creative powers of generative AI models or proposals to design brain computer interfaces or create machines with artificial consciousness or moral agency, right? So this is what I mean when I say that computing professionals, I think, are arguably being set up for moral and social failure. Um, where do we find the creative moral intelligence to chart a new course forward? Uh, and you're not gonna find it in the moral philosophers either uh, for reasons I probably don't need to explain, right? We are, we are not the salvation. Okay, so um, we have this uh, bootstrapping uh, problem. Um, we can't solve it uh, without technology, but the picture of technical excellence that we've constructed uh, isn't really uh, adequate. Um, now, you might say, okay, you've painted a, a, a problem uh, and a need to kind of uh, uh, create a, a radical reformation of the picture of technical excellence that, um, uh, that, we, uh, that we reinforce, that we educate for, and you might say, uh, look, that's just unrealistic, right? Um, there's no way uh, that we can solve this bootstrapping uh, problem that you've presented. Uh, but I think it's important to, to keep in mind that, um, look, if, if things really are on the brink of, of crisis, we don't have any choice. Um, in a leaky lifeboat with a violent storm approaching, there's no proposal of the passengers that's idealistic or, or naive if it's the only way right, to bring the boat to shore. 
So we got to do whatever we got to do. Okay, in the last uh, 10 minutes or so of the talk, I want to describe some particular realignments of virtue that I think might be necessary in order to meet this, this challenge uh, that lies ahead, right? Okay, um, so um, first of all, I think we have to go beyond our kind of traditional views of, of what excellence is, particularly in the commercial and technical sphere. Um, some of you might be familiar if you're old enough with these kinds of posters that, that used to appear uh, on the walls of nearly every Silicon Valley uh, um, business or, or unicorn. Um, and, uh, and, and their definitions of uh, excellence, right, were always kind of ludicrously shallow. Um, but also, you know, in, in kind of instructive on how we got where we are, right? Uh, teachings like this tell us that excellence is the result of, quote, caring more than others think is wise, risking more than others think is safe, dreaming more than others think is practical, expecting more than others think is possible. The excellent person is a solitary eagle who soars uh, above the judgment of others, tied to no one, grounded and constrained by no entanglements of duty or responsibility for the safety and welfare of others. They risk more than others think is safe without asking who or what their actions will put at risk and how they'll be protected. In short, they move fast and break things, right? And uh, I'll just uh, kind of pass through. There's a, there's a few examples of this that, uh, uh, that I wanted to uh, highlight, but I think for time, I'll just move forward. My point is that uh, there is a flaw in the philosopher's exaltation of virtue as, as excellence and its cultivation as a promise of salvation, right? The very notion of excellence that most widely resonates in our cultures and our most powerful institutions is inextricably linked with the habits and traits of character that built an unsustainable world and the forms of life that we need virtue to escape, okay? So that takes us back to the bootstrapping problem. So I think that even what we think of the best qualities of the noblest among our technologists, our entrepreneurs, um, are almost by definition gonna be coupled to habits and patterns of action um, that are embedded in our uh, presently attractive ways of life and not the new ones we must create. And I think this, uh, carries over powerfully into the AI for good narrative. So uh, I want to ask this question, how good is the AI uh, for good vision, right? What is AI for good good for? Now, if you look at uh, some of the AI for good proposals uh, that have been funded, and I'm picking here on kind of Microsoft's uh, uh, um, arm of, uh, of funding of, of AI for good research, it's clear that the AI apples don't fall far from uh, the tree. That is, they don't fall far from the vision of uh, excellence uh, that has actually created the problems that AI for good is supposedly going to solve. They replicate the very functions of AI that are criticized elsewhere, only for supposedly nobler ends, right? So they surveil uh, everything, right? Um, so AI for good uh, projects, a lot of times are surveillance projects. It's just that they want to surveil things like flu, and uh, wildlife and environmental and biological soundscapes, right? But the impulse is, uh, is still uh, to use AI uh, to surveil. Uh, they want to analyze and predict everything uh, from marine heat waves to algal blooms to teen mental health crises, right? Uh, they wanna compute everything, right? So one of the AI for good uh, uh, proposals is a planetary computer uh, initiative to create a multi-petabyte catalog of global environmental data with intuitive APIs and applications. And of course it has to be developed on the Microsoft Azure platform. Um, so my point is that these applications, you know, I mean, look, a lot of them are incontestably good, but they still constrain the possibility space of goodness to what we already know how to do and are in the habit of doing with computers, what we already think is good to do with computers. And I think they also do so in a way that, um, you know, requires a lot of data, a lot of compute power, a lot of surveillance tech, and, and this pushes low tech or alternative tech options out of view for funding. Uh, they also affirm apolitical, distanced and passive and low risk conceptions of doing good, right? Uh, the, the strategy is observing, analyzing, categorizing, categorizing and measuring social harms that we already know about rather than protesting, obstructing, redirecting, interfering, changing, and restructure, restructuring harmful forces in society. They entrench uh, techno-solutionist and morally defanged views of innovation, right? So for one of these proposals, they say an innovation is a process, tool, approach, 
or a digital solution that has a functional prototype or proof of concept ready to be piloted. We use the word solution and innovation interchangeably. Notice here that there's really nothing in this narrative about progress, about uh, any virtues that we uh, would not find replicated in, again, the kind of 90s uh, uh, business uh, and, and tech environment. So uh, consider, for example, if we think about the CEO of OpenAI, a company whose stated mission is to make sure that AI benefits all of humanity. He recently bragged that tools like ChatGPT will not only make us more productive, and consider that that's his first thought when it comes to benefiting humanity uh, and what other moral priorities that passes over, but that he points out that uh, these tools might do things like deliver basic goods like medical care to those who can't afford it. Now, what I think is interesting about this is that the possibility that a world where people everywhere can afford care is chosen and built is beyond his moral vision. Now, maybe he's just a vicious person, but I think that answer is lazy and likely false. There are some obviously bad actors in the tech space that I probably don't have to name, but I don't think that demonizing tech and AI leaders generally will help us to see why we are where we are. If anything, I think we're seeing an expression of the virtues of innovation, which we've been celebrating since the industrial revolution began. Ingenuity, perseverance, efficiency, speed, irrepressible optimism, thinking big, and the willingness to fail in the pursuit of greatness, which is to say scale. We've been describing these as virtues, and yet I don't think these are the virtues that will carry us safely into the future. I think some of these virtues might be traps, gravity wells that entrench maladapted habits rather than sparking the constructive adjustment of human excellence to meet our future needs. Consider things like you know, independent thinking, right? Which sounds like a great virtue uh, to leads you to decide you can do your own research on the internet and decide uh, for yourself uh, whether you know the COVID vaccine uh, actually is effective or not, or whether climate change is real, or consider the virtue of perseverance. Right, one of the modern mantras of of leadership and personal excellence has always been to keep going, to not give up, uh, to endure hardship and and push on. Well, where does that virtue leave us today? Um, it leaves us, you know, with a social network that degrades the pillars of democracy further every day because Mark Zuckerberg learned the virtue of perseverance, right? He's not gonna give up. He, he'll he keep going and keep saying he'll do better. And if he did walk away, we wouldn't respect him for it, right? We don't know what virtuous giving up, virtuous resignation looks like. It's not in our moral vocabulary, um, but maybe it needs to be. Maybe the world would be in a better state if we knew how to give up and start again in a, in a new key. Um, and I think about also the way we, we uh, kind of devalorize the virtues of resistance uh, that come from social movements, right? We, we characterize young people in the streets, not as practically wise, but as impetuous, as impatient, as angry, just because they refuse to keep walking into their graves, right? They're labeled resistors and agitators. They're um, immoderate, they're disrespectful. So, what are we saying when we frame actions in this way? Um, I, I, I think what's really interesting is that if we think about the virtues of technology, and I'm gonna wrap up now, um, we, we, we think about the virtues of delivery and never the virtues of deliverance, right? Resistance is a bad thing. The virtues are efficiency, seamlessness, speed, lossless transmission. Um, and also what they very rarely are, are the virtues of restoration and repair, uh, the virtues that are needed for a circular global economy. Those are essentially absent in the tech space, right? Where uh, repair and restoration are, are, are virtues of sort of old engineers who, who kind of fix things as opposed to uh, the people who, who build new things, right? And our, our uh, uh, philosophical uh, history doesn't help either, right? Because it devalorizes uh, the uh, uh, role of uh, technology in virtue, in wisdom, right? From Plato and Aristotle, we've separated the, the notion of technical excellence and moral excellence. And we're living through the consequences of that now, right? So what I want to close with then is to consider what kind of technomoral futures uh, we might have envisioned 
uh, with a different profile of the virtues. Technology is conceivable as more than deterministic engines of economic production, exploitation, and political domination. Could we see technologies, including AI, uh, as being able to be built as expressions of human freedom and solidarity, or even as new avenues for the materialization of love? Because technologies can be, and often have been, engines not merely of war and wealth, but engines of creative play, of artistic expression, of social care, of service and comfort to others. We need to reclaim technological culture for a sustainable moral vision. And yet for the most part, our moral lights are shining in the wrong direction. We can't pull ourselves up by these bootstraps. We need instead a shared heroic project. I say that quite seriously, a movement of creative practical wisdom to jointly explore the renewal and expansion of new and better technomoral possibilities. And I think, in those possibilities are our hopes for finally and belatedly flourishing together. Thank you. Looking forward to the questions. Thank you very much, Shannon. That was really fascinating and a great way to think about some of the challenges of technical excellence and moral excellence and how do we bring those worlds together. Now, we've got a great set of questions here and so I'm gonna, dive into a couple of them and kick off with a, a question around this comparative nature of technical excellence and technomoral wisdom. A question here from, from David, who thanks you for a very thought provoking presentation, but asks for your thoughts on the forces that shape human actions. For example, what do you think about the reward and drivers of technical excellence in comparison to the rewards and drivers of technomoral wisdom? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, one of the things that I end up talking about very often when I'm speaking to policymakers or when I'm speaking to um, companies who sort of bring me in to talk about you know, AI ethics or data ethics and how they can, or responsible AI and how they can bring that into their organization. One of the things I end up talking about a lot is the incentives um, that uh, they're, um, uh, community or uh, teams um, are driven by. And I say, look, you can talk about principles all day long. It will absolutely get you nowhere. In fact, it will fool you into thinking uh, that you're um, that you're addressing uh, the, the need to, to build more ethical technology if you talk about what our principles are and you don't talk about what our incentives are. Um, so uh, I very much think that this is uh, something that moral philosophers have really ignored. Um, that is the, the way that humans respond to the environment, right? Philosophers like to talk about what's in our heads and how what's in our heads drive us, but what in our, what's in our head is coupled with uh, the, the environment and the ways that we are um, attuned to it. And so, you know, it's not, uh, I think, um, somehow selling out uh, morality to talk about the fact that we respond to incentives. And um, I think even in moral behavior, we respond to um, the incentives that come from the social world when we behave um, in caring and trustworthy ways. It doesn't mean that uh, there aren't principled reasons to uh, to be virtuous even when you know the incentives aren't there. But I think if you construct a world where all the incentives push uh, people towards, for example, unsustainable practices, and you leave those incentives in place, but then you basically just lecture people about uh, the virtues of, uh, of sustainability, of, um, um, of, of environmental uh, justice, uh, and you don't ask how the incentives are going to be changed for people, you're setting everyone up for failure. Um, so I don't know if that was what the question was coming, where the question was coming from, but um, I think this is a, a, a neglected in, in ingredient in the conversation is to talk about what are the incentives for a techno moral virtue that we need to create. Thanks, Shannon. And that's prompting some follow up questions here as well. Uh, There's a question from Andreas that is um, that asks or comments that AI as a force impacting society is largely driven not by individuals, but by corporations. And you showed some examples of a corporate view of what AI for good means. So the question is, do we need virtues for corporations that are different mm -hmm. than the profit motive, AKA greed? 
and our virtues for corporations different than for individuals? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. Um, and uh, I've been thinking about this uh, a lot. I'm, I'm actually working on a paper with a, with a colleague where we're trying to explore this. Um, and, you know, I, I don't think that, uh, I'm not sure that the language of virtue fits the corporation, in part because as a virtue ethicist, um, I'm, I'm a, very much attuned to the uh, affective dimension of virtue. That is that um, there is an emotional element to moral intelligence that I don't think corporations can replicate. And I think it might be dangerous um, to project that onto uh, them uh, or it or ignore the absence of the ability to kind of um, uh, develop that appropriate emotional attunement to the moral landscape that the virtue requires. That being said, um, if we talk about, you know, a, a, a a, a, a version of virtue that is specifically constructed to fit the kind of entities that corporations are, where we're not talking about moral virtue, right? But we're talking about a kind of institutional virtue. Um, that I think is possible. Um, that is, we can talk about the kinds of um, habits uh, that can be cultivated and the kinds of vision that can be cultivated in corporations. Um, and I, I think that can, uh, can help. But again, going back to the previous question, I actually think it's dangerous to do this if we then pretend that we don't need to change the incentives for corporations, right? Um, because we have to create a world in which those who want to pursue entrepreneurship or those who want to pursue uh, commercial activity um, can flourish by doing that in a way that sustains uh, human flourishing, right? And if we say, look, you should, in fact, cultivate these habits of acting sustainably and responsibly. Oh, but if you do it, you're going to fail in the marketplace. By the way, we're going to we're we're not going to change that. That's that's bananas, right? That's absolutely not going to work. And so I think things like regulation um, are we you know we we keep saying the same thing, but it's because it's the only thing that has ever worked as a way of rewarding responsible. Uh, and safe practice. It's it's why we have airplanes that don't fall out of the sky every single week. It's why we have medicines that you know uh, we can we can more or less trust not to kill us. Um, it's because we created regulations to ensure that those who produced these commodities uh, did so safely and responsibly, even when that was costly, because we made it more costly for them to make unsafe things. The fact that we're still not doing this with with new technologies uh, is is. Uh, I mean, this is one of those problems where the answer is actually uh, quite simple. It doesn't solve the problem, the bootstrapping problem uh, that, that I've pointed out, um, but I don't think we'll get anywhere unless we just confront the necessity of regulation to, to raise the bar for all corporations so that they can compete on a playing field uh, where uh, the prize is human well-being and not um, sort of selling out the future for the next quarterly round of profits. We have time for one last question. So I, I want to come back to your provocative statement in essence that um, as technologists, are we educating technologists in the right way or are we setting technologists up for failure? So there's a question here from Fani who, who questions what the education of technologists should look like and what models should we be using? And as moral sensitivity is part of our system of empathy and compassion attached to logical reasoning and high self-awareness, the emphasis in education is primarily put on cognitive confident, uh, competencies. So how do we, as, as educationists, um, educators, how do we cultivate intuition, virtue, and care for others as we think about design and implementation? Yeah. Um... That's a really tough problem. And I think the, the issue here is that the current institutional structures of higher education in most countries um, aren't receptive to the kinds of changes, largely because of resource constraints that come from kind of defunding of higher education in a lot of countries where you know organizations are pressured to do more with less. And you know, when you talk to a dean of an engineering school, you know, they'll say, look. Maybe we could integrate ethics into a little bit of our curriculum, or maybe we could 
offer one course in the ethics of technology. We could kind of fit that in, but, they're, but they're, you know, they'll say, look, that, that, that's, at the, that's what we could do at the most because our graduates need these technical skills and they're already taking a curriculum that is overpacked with content um, and they have no freedom uh, in their schedules because, you know, we have to, we have to graduate them with these, with these new technical skills. We can't afford to bring in the kind of social, historical, ethical context that you want to give them. Uh, and again, I, I understand that, you know, they're, they're operating in a resource constrained environment under incentives that don't allow the kind of radical transformation of the educational landscape uh, that someone like me would, would like to see. Um, so again, I think we need to back up a step and sort of say, how do we change the resource picture for higher education and the incentives uh, so that we can afford to do some of these more ambitious restructurings of, uh, of technical education? Uh, I do think there are some uh, countries, though, where uh, they, they have gotten a little bit further in some of these ways. I've always been a bit, bit of an admirer of uh, one aspect of, for example, the Dutch uh, technical universities, uh, which is that they integrate uh, the philosophical, social, and historical dimensions of technology into the university setting, right? So um, there are philosophers of technology sitting in pretty much every, uh, multiple philosophers of technology at pretty much every Dutch technical university. Uh, so it, it's presented as part of what it means to get uh, an excellent technical education, as opposed to something that can be distant that's in a college on the other side of campus that you never interact with. Um, so I think there are models that we can look at uh, for, for doing this better. But I also think we, we have to just be honest with ourselves that if you think about what we do when we train uh, in most countries, medical professionals, think about how long the training is to become a physician. Um, uh, think about how many different dimensions of knowledge we, we pack into uh, that. Um, and it, yeah, it takes, it, it, it takes a lot longer than a, than a four-year degree, right? Um, but we think when you're holding human lives in your hands, that's necessary. I think we be, ought to be honest about the fact that, you know, to, to build the technologies that will uh, determine the conditions for human flourishing in the next hundred years, uh, maybe you need six years of education and not four and may, or five instead of four. And maybe we just need to accept that and restructure the environment to make that possible. Thanks, Shannon. And in fact, your comments here around being able to integrate the world of humanities and the social sciences with the world of technology is something that we're very focused on at the Monash Data Futures Institute as well. So it's been lovely listening to you today. And we really thank you for joining us for this lecture. Um, and for all of you who've asked questions that we haven't had time to answer, my apologies, but thank you for all of your very positive feedback on this lecture series. And we look forward to seeing you again in an upcoming event. So as I start to wrap up here, it really has been a pleasure hosting Shannon today, and I hope you've all enjoyed it as much as I have. We do invite all of you who've joined us to stay engaged with us at the Monash Data Futures Institute and to attend our upcoming events. And for those of you who've been following us today on social media, uh, we encourage you to continue th to, com to join the conversation. You can also join our mailing list by signing up to receive news, event notifications, and our newsletter uh, by signing up through our website. And we'll share the links in the chat so you can also visit our website for further information about the Institute. Uh, it's been a great discussion today, and I and I rem uh, I stay challenged with this focus around how do we educate for the future, and for those of us who have a technology background, what do we need to learn in order for us to bring together this notion of technical excellence and moral excellence uh, to be able to address the bootstrapping problem and really to focus on. AI for good, as Sharon has so uh, elegantly um, articulated here. So Shannon, thank you again. And to our audience, thank you all for joining us. You've been wonderful. And I, I really appreciate all the questions you've asked us. And we look forward to seeing you again in a upcoming event and to join us in these valuable and provocative discussions. Thanks again, Shannon, for joining us. Thanks to our audience. And we'll see you thank again you. very soon. Thank you, everyone.